All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, as I've watched the RNC and the DNC before it unfold, both parties attempt to show some compassion for those who've been sickened or lost loved ones to COVID-19. But I've been flabbergasted by the utter lack of care and concern for the millions who are suffering economically right now. The millions in bread lines facing homelessness, the ranks of the long-term unemployed, their faces, their voices, their stories. And most importantly, the policy that they need to be made whole has been virtually absent from the discussion. Can you imagine ignoring the economic calamity of the Great Depression or the Great Recession in the midst of the fallout? And yet our politicians are so insulated from this suffering, they barely bother a passing mention. You'll recall that when President Trump, with much fanfare, signed his stimulus executive orders, Steve Mnuchin assured struggling Americans that they would benefit from the $300 plus up in benefits within a week or two. Now, that was almost exactly two weeks ago. Shock of shocks, Americans are not, in fact, benefiting from that executive order unemployment plus up. In fact, only two states have managed to implement the benefit at all thus far. That's according to Bloomberg. Arizona and Texas are giving $300 in aid, notably not the $400 that the executive order was billed as, since that extra 100 bucks has to come from state coffers, and Congress has failed to provide a desperately needed state bailout. Apparently, 30 states have been approved for the program, and at least one South Dakota has stated they do not intend to participate at all. But only a handful of states nationwide appear anywhere close to implementing that benefit. On top of all that, economists estimate that the funds provided by the federal government will last for six weeks at most. Does anyone think we're going to be out of this in six weeks? So all that pressure around another round of stimulus, all those tense negotiations and impetus to help struggling Americans and small business, it's basically amounted to nothing. There's no UBI. There's no state and local aid. There's no additional PPP. And for the overwhelming majority as of now, no lifeline of unemployment plus up. The American people have been left high and dry. So what happens now? It seems like some sort of reckoning is inevitable, right? And there are, in fact, a number of new alarming indicators. While the stock market keeps climbing, hitting record after record, and the housing market gets hotter and hotter as those with the means search for houses with yards in the suburbs, consumer confidence has just hit its lowest level in six years. Now, that's, of course, a troubling sign just in terms of how Americans are feeling about their lives and their prospects right now. But it also has direct implications for the economy as it could portend a pullback on consumer spending, the lifeblood of our consumerist economy. Meanwhile, permanent job loss is increasing. In fact, a new estimate projects that these losses are approaching the heights of the Great Recession. 33% of those laid off in March have lost their jobs entirely as month after month of this pandemic has dragged on. And now, with the PPP loan period expiring, that number is only set to grow. Now, particularly troubling development is the number of workers who are now joining what they call the long-term unemployed. One of the things that we all learned during the Great Recession, if you'll recall, was how unemployment can become a sort of trap. The longer that someone is unemployed, the harder it is for them to get back in the workplace. That's part of why the idea of a quick recovery seems increasingly fanciful. As one economist told The Washington Post, I don't think you can have a pandemic and think everything's going to snap back to normal and we'll be fine. This will get worse before this gets better. In another telling and troubling sign for the human beings in this country, the companies that are performing the best right now, that are driving some of these big stock market gains, are the ones that depend on humans the least. That's often tech companies. So companies reliant on humans, on the other hand, are disproportionately struggling. The fact that the least people-intensive businesses are the ones outperforming with share prices leaping, well, that's great for those investors involved. It's not great for the humans who were already lacking in good jobs, already being treated like disposable, interchangeable cogs. And there's a final sign that may be the most intriguingly ominous of all. So never before have institutional and individual investors been more at odds in their view of the market, with individual investors way more pessimistic and way more bullish, bearish than the big guys. Why does this matter? Well, a lot of people assume that the big institutional players must be more sophisticated and thus better predictors of the direction of the market. That's not actually the case. Instead, they tend to engage in a lot more sheep-like herd behavior. 
Why? Well, because it's okay to be wrong and lose a bunch of money if you're running one of these funds, as long as you're wrong in the same way that all your rivals are. It's sort of like the world of punditing, where it's perfectly fine, celebrated even, to be consistently wrong all the time, as long as you're wrong in all the approved ways. So when there's a large gap between the individual investors and the big players, it could mean that a few big movements from the institutional players could set off a stampede. Now, right now, people are saying the things that they always say before the storm hits. Oh, this time it's different. This time we figured it out. This time the good times will continue to roll. First of all, let's be clear that for millions upon millions, crash, collapse, and depression have already arrived. But perhaps a look at our history would also sound a word of warning for those believing that the economy will just snap back and that the stock market is going to ride high forever. In early March of 1929, just a few months before the Great Depression, the stock market experienced a small crash, much like the small crash that we experienced in the early days of the pandemic. But pretty quickly, despite a number of ominous warning signs, investors got right back in the game, booing the markets with gains piled on top of gains that lasted all the way up until September of that year. Yale economist Irving Fisher observed this situation and infamously declared that, quote, stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. The massive Black Thursday crash arrived shortly after this confident prediction. Or you might recall all those wise minds who assured us that the housing market was perfectly fine and that no reckoning was coming soon or ever really before, of course, everything collapsed in 2008. So maybe this time really will be different. Maybe everyone will just get back to the status quo level of drudgery and pain rather than the supercharged depression level of drudgery and pain. But I just can't look at these numbers and the failed state nature of our government's lack of response and believe that this is all going to turn out okay. And obviously, Sagar, this has incredibly direct political implications because we're watching like the DNC and the RNC. This whole thing that's happening for millions of people is completely absent from the conversation. Trump is trying to run on this projection of like, the stock market's high and we nailed it and my leadership and we're gonna be fine. We had this great economy and this is just a little blip and we're gonna get right back to it. Look, if things continue to kind of slowly get better and people can see some some track record that has them getting back to where they were before all this hit, then that lands. But I look at these indicators and I have to think that This cannot hold. This state of affairs that we're living in now cannot hold. And they were trying to do a stimulus. They never got around to doing it. Trump basically took it off the table by issuing his his meaningless executive orders. And now they're not even talking about doing anything. I agree with you. I feel crazy sometimes whenever I talk about this because you see the top line numbers, the housing market boom, all of this. Just this story actually just broke from the Washington Post. Half of Americans have actually saved more or paid down more debt since the outbreak began. So we live, you know, people talk about polarization and all that. The real polarization is economically, which is that if you're at the top 50%, you're doing better in this crisis. You save more money, you pay down more debt, you use your stimulus check in order to buy consumer goods and all that. If you're at the bottom 25% or even the bottom 30, that stimulus check was the difference between making rent or not. That unemployment was the difference between being able to buy food or not. It actually lowered poverty in the United States because right. it increased overall aggregate incomes for many of these people. It's like I was saying earlier in the show, though. I don't, honestly, I think so many of these people are so downtrodden, are so just feel that Washington has failed them now for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I'm not saying they blame themselves, but they expect nothing. And I think that many of them are just non-voters. I mean, I, I cite that study here a lot, the Knight Foundation, the 100 Million American Project, yeah. where they look and they see what is the number one reason that people don't vote, lack of faith in political institutions, period. And they feel that both Republicans and Democrats don't work on their behalf. I can empathize a little bit with that. I think what the real thing is that the Democrats and the Republicans are fighting for the votes of this half, which have moved mm-hmm. or paid down more debt. You're absolutely they're making right. more money. So they're like doing a tug of war over suburbanites and all these other people while millions of others don't want to vote because, or don't feel like voting because they don't care. And realistically, they're not really wrong, right? Like it's not going to impact your bottom line all that much, which I think is a big problem. And it should. Like yeah. the fact that President Trump hasn't embraced the idea of like, let's get everybody money to get through this is a massive failure. The fact that Joe Biden hasn't aggressively said like, 
he, he gave his speech and he was like, here's what I'm going to do on day one. I was like, okay, here it comes, right? Here, we're going to hear what the program is. And he has some white babies, put out some stuff about what his plan would be. But it, ha it wasn't talked about at all at the DNC. And his day one plan was like, PPE and we're going to work on a vaccine. And, and yes, okay, we need to do those things. But the economic response, the economic piece is completely absent. And I think you're right. They are so, first of all, they don't even see it. They're so insulated from Nobody it. Nobody sees it. The people that they're talking to, the people they interact with, they're all doing fine. So it's invisible to them. And both of these conventions, both of these parties, frankly, are completely aimed at like winning over suburbanites. Yeah. That's what they're, that is the action that they're after. And so, yeah, you have this massive divergence in economic power. You have this massive divergence in terms of political power. And it creates like a country within a country where the experience of living here is radically different depending on what side of the class divide you're on. I think that's right. Coming up, executive director of American Compass in front of the show, Orrin Cass, is going to talk about an RNC internal memo hmm. that reveals what Rust Belt voters are really thinking about this election. That one rising continues.